My name is Rob and this year I'm cycling across Africa, from Cairo to Cape Town. I currently finished cycling the first country of the journey, Egypt, from top to bottom. And I already made three videos about the truly wild adventure I had there. A crazy roller coaster of emotions. But I don't only care about documenting my journey on a bicycle. What equally fascinates me in my travels are the cyclists, where I take a break from cycling in order to explore the misunderstood, neglected, and off the beaten path regions of each country I pass by. I try to make sense of these places, of the people that live there, and try to learn more about how the world really functions. And Egypt is full of these places. With the limited time I had on my visa, I explored as many of them as possible, independently, without knowing that all of them were going to be linked by one central idea. In this video, I'm meeting a man who was born and raised in one of the world's largest cemeteries, visiting the gigantic trash city of Cairo, which has developed the most effective recycling system in the world, and most importantly, dealing with grief for the first time in my life. This is not a linear video. It's more of an intertwined train of thought, tackling various themes, locations, and topics that I deem important to communicate about. Topics like politics, religion, poverty, trash, unemployment, grief, and death. They all fall under one category. We usually don't like to speak about these topics. It bothers us. We avoid them, even if they're some of the most important in our life. This is the first side quest of Project Africa. The first location I explored was back in Cairo, far from the banks of the Nile River, the busy markets and the touristic sites, somewhere more obscure and complex, where people literally live submerged in trash, and where the pollution level is 11 times higher than the safe limit set by the World Health Organization. Welcome to Hai Zabalin, the garbage city of Cairo. Today is the first side quest of the journey. Today I'm with Shahab, Angelo and Luca. It's actually my first time in this part of Cairo. That guy explored all of Egypt and he never came like right next door. Yeah. It's been seven years that people have been collecting trash in this neighborhood. It's a Coptic Christian neighborhood in majority, 70,000 inhabitants, and they're all sorting out waste for a living. And they're doing really hard work in very poor conditions. It's pretty admirable work. I want to shed light on it today. And I want to document and just see how they're doing this, how they're living in those conditions. Look at this street full of garbage. There's garbage everywhere you go. My goal is to speak to as many people as possible, to get a glimpse into their daily lives and the problems they face here. In Arabic, the Zabalin mean the garbage people. The Zabalin are descendants of farmers who started migrating from Upper Egypt to Cairo in the 1940s and found profitability in sorting the waste of the city. Garbage is obviously central in their lives, and throughout the years they've adopted a unique system to divide their tasks strategically. The men, they go and collect the trash, and the women and children are the ones that sort out the trash. In a nutshell, each building in and around Cairo has its own Zabal, or garbage collector. The Zabal goes door to door using donkey pulled carts or pickup trucks in the zone he's responsible for, picks up the trash and gets paid by the inhabitants. The Zabel then transports the trash back to his home in the garbage city to be sorted and then recycled by the rest of his family. Let me show you guys how they recycle here. One of the reasons why I initially wanted to explore the garbage city was because of one shocking fact I had heard about the place. The Zabalin here recycle up to 80% of the waste that they collect, whereas most Western garbage collecting companies usually only recycle 20 to 25% of their waste. <laughs> Okay. We're learning the ways of Zabalin today. This is PET plastic bottles. We're going to put it in a bigger bag for them to sort it out afterwards and probably recycle 80 to 90% of it. So uh... The people here earned my respect. Not only is this hands-on quality work, but they also find ways to recycle a huge amount of waste from all across Cairo, one of the biggest and most populated cities in the world. And walking around here, I noticed a wide variety of materials being used, including glass, all kinds of metals and plastics, cardboard, paper, and miscellaneous general wastes. Once the garbage is sorted, they sell it to middlemen or create new materials from the recycled matter that they also end up selling to factories. Throughout the decades of developing their family-run micro-enterprises to generate jobs and heavily investing in their tools and machines, they have perfected one of the most effective recycling systems in the world. Coming into Zabalin, I didn't expect people to be friendly or anything. I had actually no expectations at all, but people are so nice and open. They're just so welcoming. They took us in, they showed us their house, how they work, how they dance, their music. It's just amazing. Even if many would consider this type of work miserable, I admire how most of the Zabalin we meet work super hard and take real pride in treating and living off of garbage. When you asked him, can I film the trash? He said, 
This is not trash. This is my work. It means so much to them. Damn. It's not trash. They take it out of heart. It's yeah. incredible. Hardworking people here, eh? We tend to neglect garbage in most places around the world. It stinks, it's ugly, and it seems useless. And neglecting it creates pollution, which makes things even worse. But the paradox with garbage is that it's worth gold if you know how to treat it. And we've been seeing how this philosophy got adopted here. They also make art out of all the trash that's collected. So for example, this is made out of the Pepsi can opener. Necklace is made out of Nespresso capsules. So creative. The Zabalin understood the garbage paradox. And since the 1940s, they have been doing the dirty job no one wants to. Waste management, which has thankfully been, for them, a very profitable source of income. But things have been changing in recent times. And every year, the inhabitants of the garbage city are threatened in many ways. Apart from living amongst the trash, an abundance of toxic molecules, and in self-built homes, many of which are in some like conditions, it's the government and recent policies that are the ones that have been affecting the most the Zabalin. In 2009, for example, the Egyptian agricultural ministry ordered the culling of all the pigs that lived there, out of fear of the swine flu spreading. The thing is that pigs played an essential role in their recycling and sorting system, as they ate all the organic waste. It's a horrible source of infectious diseases. The smell is really, really bad. I don't even know how people live lifetimes here, like it's insane. They live in very poor living conditions, no one looks at them. They live literally in trash and they jeopardize their own lives to be able to sort the trash. The mere existence of the Zabelin have become threatened by the Cairo municipal authorities, as they decided a couple of years ago to award annual contracts to three multinational garbage disposal companies, which disregard the decades of knowledge and hands-on work that the Zabelin have perfected, jeopardizing their way of life as they now have less work and are not being compensated for this change. The company started collecting trash from garbage bins placed at central collection points on the streets. But the thing is, most inhabitants of Cairo preferred the door-to-door -door garbage pickup done by the Zabalin, which was way more practical. With time, the foreign companies realized that they needed the Zabalin, and as a consequence, they subcontracted them. But the system didn't last long, as obviously the Zabalin were underpaid. So contradictory to the original objective, the presence of private companies has reduced the rates and quality of waste management in Cairo. And it was easy to notice the current trash crisis in Egypt while we cycled down the Nile in the following weeks, as we saw what the lack of a proper waste management system does in the countryside. The way people dispose of their trash was simply by burning it every morning and night, and the air was full of toxic molecules. Today, the people of Zabalin are fighting every day to survive. When we ask if they had any hope despite dealing with so many obstacles all at once, we recognized a pattern. And this pattern was to provide their kids with education. We were talking to some guy and as an Egyptian, I really understand whatever he was saying and it was so emotional. He was talking about how he works so hard in very trashy conditions, like just so he can provide for his family so that his children would grow up educated. He said he's not educated and most of the people that live here don't know how to read and write, but he works so hard to provide for them so they can go to college and study for higher education. Some guy told me he would not eat so that he can pay for his son's lessons so he would go to college. And yeah, it was so emotional. Education is a way out of misery and many are conscious of it here. Parents sacrifice so much to get their kids access to knowledge and skills that would make them have a more stable and controlled future than living in the garbage city. Tu parles français? Oui. Comment tu t'appelles? Je m'appelle Tasbih Bakhit. This girl, Tasbih, she speaks French. She's at the French school that's called saint vincent de paul It was refreshing to meet a few other kids who had access to education and could even speak a foreign language, but they unfortunately were not the majority. The truth is that Egypt is infamous for having high unemployment rates, with about one third of the youth being unemployed. Egypt is a very populated country, and the large amount of young people entering the job market each year does not match the lower demand for labor. Egypt has also been struggling in many other ways recently. When we first started our cycling journey in the country, one dollar was 24 Egyptian pounds, but by the time we left the country, it rose up to 34 Egyptian pounds. One of the reasons for this rapid inflation is the war in Ukraine, as Egypt is surprisingly the biggest wheat importer in the world, and was used to importing it almost exclusively from Ukraine. For us visiting, things became incredibly cheap, but for those earning their salaries in Egyptian pounds, it was a real daily struggle. With such life conditions, many turn to religion to cope with their harsh reality, and the Zabalin are no exception. Just looking around the trash city, you could see the omnipresence of symbols, hinting at the faith that people would practice in this zone of the city. Pictures, posters, and icons of Saint Mary are everywhere, as well as the typical Coptic cross tattoo on people's wrists. Egypt is in majority Muslim, but here, 90% of Hayez Zabalin is Christian, a ratio that is very rare to find in the Middle East. It's a big part of their culture, and they dedicate a lot of time to their faith. And speaking of about faith, we were now heading to a very special place of worship, only a couple of hundred meters away.
Now we're going towards the cave church. It's on the cliffs nearby Zabalin. Carved in the rocks under the cliffs of the Mu'attam, the Zabalin built the monastery of St. Simon. We're arriving into the network of cave churches. There's not one, actually, there's multiple, there's four, I think. This part of Cairo is just unreal, to be honest. The cave church has a seating capacity of 20,000, making it the largest church in the Middle East. This is really impressive. It's carved in the rock on this huge, massive cliff. And the garbage city is right behind here, a bit further, a couple of hundred meters away. So before even entering the cave church, we started hearing sounds of people crying, like a huge amount of people crying. And then we start seeing people wearing black going out of the church and they're really crying and like screaming. Apparently it's a funeral and that's how Coptic Christians uh, in Egypt express themselves when there's a funeral, apparently. I've never seen that before in any other funeral. It was very expressive. Egyptian Coptic Christians seem very emotional when it comes to death and openly express their sadness, frustration and grief with screams. But parts of this expression were quite familiar to me. I could see subtle similarities with what I'm used to seeing in Western culture. Black was also worn and sadness was felt and expressed after the loss of someone. But those reactions aren't universal. It's just fascinating to see how uh, different cultures represent death and react to death in very, very different ways. In a lot of parts of Africa, it's actually celebrated. Or Dia de los Muertos in Mexico, also same thing. So yeah, it's just very interesting to see people react this way to someone they love being uh, dead. It made me wonder, how would I react to the death of someone I love? I've never gone through this type of grief before. Beyond the cave church and the garbage city, there's another neighborhood where death is omnipresent. On the other side of the highway, near Hayy Zabalin, lies the Qarrafa, Cairo's city of the dead. A series of vast Islamic era necropolises that constitutes one of the largest cemeteries on earth. Here we are in the city of the dead, probably one of the biggest cemeteries in the world. And there's tombstones everywhere and there's people living among those tombstones. And one of the reasons we were here today was to meet one of them, Ramadan, who's been living among the dead all of his life. Charafna. Wow, okay. Ramadan, he was born and raised in this cemetery. And it's a really calm area compared to the rest of Cairo. Like you can barely hear anything. You just hear the traffic noise is from the highway nearby but that's it like here there's barely any noise the city of the dead was developed over many centuries and all social classes are found buried here it contains both the graves of Cairo's commoners as well as elaborate mausoleums of many of the city's elites and historical rulers people started moving and living here a couple of centuries ago due to Cairo's intensive urbanization because of the housing shortage in the city some people were led to even squat tomb enclosures as improvised housing the houses we're in were built like 200 years ago and people since this time have been living amongst the dead, which is crazy. Right here, there's like a kitchen and there's like a toilet on the left. After having this overview of what the city of the dead looked like, Ramadan sat us down in typical Egyptian fashion to serve us tea. It's like, you can't live without tea. Before food, after food, when you wake up, before you sleep. Tea is a way of bonding yeah. with a person you don't know. And it's like, yo, let me offer you something. You're breaking the ice through it, you know? And tea is just so abundant and very cheap, so everyone can just afford it, and it's a great way to socialize. We took advantage of the tea break to learn about Ramadan's role here and talk about death. Every person like him um, controls maybe like 50, 60, maybe 100 tombs. He's in charge of like opening the cemetery when someone arrives and burying and then closing up the cemetery. And then after 40 days, he reopens the cemetery to recollect all the bones on one side and leaving empty place for new deaths. How is it to live around death all the time? And what do you think personally about death? We're all gonna die. I'm very curious because uh, in some places of the world, they react to death in very different ways. <laughs> Yeah, that's true, that's true. What about you? 
when when your grandfather died and you came here, were you? Yeah, I'm on the verge of crying. So yeah, and... okay, I, I want to <laughs> ask more questions. We'll, we'll go and explore. While we were here, we wanted to find the tomb of Shahab's grandfather, who was buried here. Shahab hadn't come since the burial. The place was a real labyrinth with an impressive amount of tombs of all shapes and sizes. In this cemetery, there's a lot of governors and important people that are buried here, actually, which puts things into perspective because as powerful and influential as you are in your life on Earth, you still end up six feet underground. Death is inevitable. I mean, it's cliche to say, but we actually tend to forget it like very often, so yeah. And after about 30 minutes of searching and asking around, we found the tomb we were looking for. Shahab entered and said a prayer as we waited for him outside. Cairo's City of the Dead was one of the most impressive cemeteries I've ever witnessed, but not the most impressive. After cycling 250 kilometers south of Cairo a few days later, we stumbled upon Zawiyat al Mayyitin. We are now in another cemetery that is in Almenia, which is south of Cairo, and we're walking up the stairs to get the beautiful view on that huge cemetery. Looks like a giant beehive because of the circular domes above the graves. Zawiyat al Mayyitin is barely known. Few people really visit Middle Egypt, and yet this was one of the largest cemeteries on earth and stretches multiple kilometers along the Nile. This place was so photogenic that it's easy to forget that hundreds of thousands of people are buried here, in majority Muslims, which makes it a very important site for locals here. I decided to follow a kid through the narrow alleys to find the best view over the cemetery for sunset. This place is a freaking labyrinth. I'm getting lost. <laughs> when I finally arrived at the top, it was very special. The beauty of the tombs, the scale of it, the patterns, it was incredible. The sun has just set, it's just magical. The Maghreb prayers, you can hear them. There's like dozens of mosques all around the city of the dead. Like when do you live moments like that? Just looking around, I started thinking about death. Why do humans build such elaborate things for people who don't even live anymore? Homo sapiens is the only species that is capable of understanding death which links a unique set of beliefs, values, and other complex ideas like abstraction. And actually, burials are one of the first anthropological proofs that humans have the capacity to think symbolically. This place is just insane. It's pretty, it's spiritual, it's calm. Symbolic thought gives us the ability to transcend the present, recall the past, and envision the future. Mourning involves remembering the past and imagining a future where mortality will eventually happen. That's maybe why we bury, as burials are a physical record of a behavior that is deeply spiritual and meaningful to us. The kids are all around the, the cemetery. More people that are alive than dead, apparently. <laughs> While I was cut up with the kids, little did I know that for the first time in my life, I was about to deal with grief of my own. Only two days later, after continuing the cycling journey south, right after reaching the city of Asyut, one of my best friends passed away. It's been an hour I've been crying because uh, there's a very dear friend of mine who passed away in a motorcycle accident back in Lebanon. It's the first time in my life that uh, I lose someone that I really care about. Uh, I lost my grandmother when I was 14, but I was still too young to really process and understand what was happening. But this is really tough. He was a mentor to me. He was an incredible person. We lived incredible things together. He just made my, my teenage years a lot more bearable. Yeah, it's really tough. I, I called some friends and told them about the sad news. And yeah, it's, it's very tough to accept someone's death. I, I was planning on doing this video about the garbage city and the city of the dead and shit's got a lot more real now you know miguel was a spanish teacher in an international school in lebanon he was a mentor for many young people at a youth club including myself his beliefs and actions were admirable as a devoted catholic he wanted to live a life full of virtue and ultimately go to heaven he always served his community was always positive and was full of life love and generosity but now he was gone forever 
At least I was very happy to see him last October and got to tell him something that I had in my mind for a long time but I didn't tell him, which was to thank him deeply for making me the person I am today, for teaching me amazing life values, for teaching me to always be young at heart and spread good energy and serve your community around you. He really taught me those values. He was one of my main pillars in my teenage years in terms of knowledge and in terms of emotional support, you know? I'm so grateful for him and it's very sad that we won't see him again, but it is the reality. The next day was a hard one. We had to keep cycling and I really wasn't in the mood to do so. Speaking about death or thinking about your own death is very different from experiencing the death of someone you love. As we arrived on the outskirts of the city, we stumbled upon a monastery and I felt the need to go inside, maybe as a way to find closure. We just arrived at the monastery of the Virgin Mary of Asyut. I've had him in my thoughts all morning while riding. I'm making a little prayer for him in his honor. It had been a long time since I had prayed. To me, prayers always felt like speaking into the void. Now I was addressing myself directly to Miguel, thanking him again for the role he played in my life, for the example he had set of what it's like to live a virtuous life. But was Miguel really listening? Is there an afterlife? We can't really prove it or deny its existence. It all comes down to faith, right? And I'm still in a phase of life where I want to learn more and search for the truth and explore what faith is to me. But talking to Miguel felt like the right thing to do for now. He was someone just very special to me. Someone that lived his life based on his values. Someone who had a lot of love to give. A lot of people were very sad after his passing. A friend of mine sent me some videos of his funeral that happened back in Lebanon. It felt like a movie, seeing his face on his coffin, it felt surreal. So that was it? That's what happens when someone dies? Coffin, tomb, cemetery, and done? It felt weird, like something was missing. Luckily, cycling helped me deal with grief and process all the hard thoughts and emotions we usually tend to avoid naturally as humans. But still, something kept on itching me. As we kept cycling south, we arrived in one of the most spectacular places on Earth. A place that would help me understand the thing that I felt was missing. We were in the city of Luxor, the world's greatest open-air museum and one of the world's oldest inhabited cities. But most importantly, it's a city where we can notice how central the concept of death was for ancient Egyptians, spiritually as well as physically. And to this day, we can see the remains of this, whether through the abundance and complexity of the tombs or the immense mortuaries. The ancient Egyptians are some of history's most successful storytellers. They shared their messages, myths and stories through time by building colossal projects that lasted millennia, accompanied by beautiful crafted art, impressive architecture and intricate details, all because of their beliefs linked to death. We can obviously start with the incredible pyramids of Giza that were built as tombs for many pharaohs and that still puzzle to this day scientists, engineers and historians. If you never saw them in person, you will never understand what I mean. And now that we were in Luxor, we went somewhere as impressive as the pyramids, but in a very different way. A valley where the tombs were built to be protected from robbers. The Valley of the Kings. We're now in the Valley of the Kings and I'm just noticing like how much engineering and architecture was involved into the burial of people. Some of the people that lived in the past were so convinced by the idea that something will happen after death that they're ready to build something as majestic and big as the Valley of the Kings. Ancient Egyptians believed that when they died, their spiritual body would continue to exist in an afterlife very similar to their living world. But not anyone could access it. The souls of the deceased had to go through a dangerous underworld world's journey to be granted access, and tombs had a role to play in this. Tombs were built during the lifetime of the person it was meant for, as they served two functions, housing the body of the dead and transmitting their soul to the underworld. The texts on the walls explained what the dead would need to know in order to complete the journey safely, and the Egyptian gods would guide the souls of the dead to the afterlife, before ultimately going through a rebirth. The god Osiris, for example, would decide on their fate. If they acted justly, maintained high religious morals, and complied with a variety of traditions, they were granted a peaceful afterlife. The people still living were also heavily involved in the afterlife journey of the deceased, as they had to conduct a series of rituals to help the soul enter the afterlife. Depending on if you were a king or a common person, it is said that the path through that underworld differed slightly, and most of what was found in a tomb depended on the status of the person buried in it. Even some animals had their place in the afterlife, Crocodiles, for example, used to be mummified, as they were thought to be sacred. But whether you're a king, a common person, or a crocodile, the core beliefs of the afterlife were the same. Death 
is perceived in very different ways depending on the generations, on the eras of history, and on the ideology and the culture of that era specifically. After cycling through the country and resting in Aswan, I thought about all the places we visited across Egypt and what I had experienced there. I was drawn to film those places independently and didn't clearly know why at first, as they seemed completely unrelated. But as time went on, I noticed a pattern. All these places involve sensitive and often repulsive themes, whether it's trash, politics, grief, and most importantly, death. We tend to avoid thinking or speaking about these subjects, blame it on human nature's short-term thinking and our survival instincts of eliminating pessimism, anxiety, and fear. And what we neglect often has the most importance to our lives, and if we avoid discussing such topics, they can affect us negatively in the long run. But humans also have a superpower, finding meaning in suffering. Culturally, Egyptians are emotional and expressive people, and many create and find meaning behind the unavoidable suffering of humankind and mortality, whether through religion, education, work, grief, myths, symbols, or stories. And as a consequence, all over the country, you find physical places that reflect that. Ancient Egyptians built unbelievable structures based on their mythology and their beliefs in an afterlife. Ramadan finds meaning and fulfillment in burying people and living among the dead with his family. The Zabbalin find meaning and pride in managing the trash of millions of people, all while trying to educate their children and deepen their faith. Modern Egyptians more broadly believe in their own version of an afterlife through their monotheistic dogmas and find importance in building some of the biggest necropolises on earth. And for me, I had found what was missing in my grieving process. Nowadays, in our fast-paced world, when an individual dies, people tend to be affected for a bit, but quickly move on with their lives. And that bothers me. It feels wrong, and I don't want that to happen with Miguel. While observing how the ancient Egyptians immortalized their dead through powerful and stunning paintings, sculptures, and structures, I realized the meaning that was lacking to my grieving process. I'm not familiar with the craft of the ancient Egyptians, but the craft I do know about is video. And I want to finish this one by sharing a couple of words about Miguel. The way he lived his life was exemplary and an important reminder of how a soul like his can have a beautiful impact on this world. Some of you knew him and some of you didn't, but it doesn't matter. I want the way I perceived him to impact you the same way he impacted me. And here's a visualization of the prayer I did to him in that monastery. Hey Miguel, you might or might not hear my prayers right now, but I'm doing it anyways. And I will be honest with you, I'm angry at you for driving your motorbike so fast on a rainy day. Now you're not with us anymore, but I guess that's how life goes, right? You know, I don't want resentment to be the central emotion of my prayer or sadness. I want it to be gratitude. And I want to show you what you meant to me. Miguel, you were one of the best people I had the chance to be friend in my life. Looking back, I spent so much of my teenage years with you. Whether it was catching jellyfish, climbing cedar trees, going on bike rides in the countryside, having our weekly junk food dinners, or following sea turtles for hours, we shared so many experiences together. And I want to thank you for all the summer camps, the snow hikes, the barbecue nights, and the football games. For teaching me all the swear words in Spanish. <laughs> for your deep laugh that brightened everywhere you went. For dedicating your precious time to act in all the stupid videos I made. I don't even know why we had so many guns involved in them. Thank you for the meaningful Saturdays where we volunteered and helped refugees. For all the manual and meaningful work we've done together. For always encouraging me to pursue my passion for photography and filmmaking. All these legendary photos wouldn't even exist. Thanks for sharing your love for Pacharan and Marcia, for our talks about theology and cinema, for the Kifak and Tax and Shu Habibi. Damn, man, I'll miss that. With you, I was free to be fully myself. There was no ridicule, goofy, or risky enough. And that created some of the best laughs of my life and made me accept who I was. I looked up to you. I wanted to be like you. Funny, fearless, thirsty for life, honest, simple, free-spirited, pure, and kind. Kind to anyone you would encounter. You're one of the few I know who dedicated their life to building virtue and genuinely wanted everyone around them to grow. A true leader. It's thanks to people like you that we become better versions of ourselves, daring to tell you when you mess up or when you should change your behavior. At your side during your best moments as well as your worst. I already told you this the last time I saw you, but you played a big role in my education and always encouraged me to find meaning behind my hardships while growing up and having strong intentions behind all I do. And I want to especially thank you for that. You weren't only a good friend, but also a brother, a mentor. You taught me to lead by example, to stay young at heart, no matter your age, to do good work always, 
to be daring, to live freely, to love and care above anything. Miguel, this is so hard to accept that you won't be among us anymore. Every time I think about you, it doesn't get easier to come to terms with reality. In my mind, you're the definition of someone who loves life and always strives to jump high. And now I genuinely hope that you're flying high. Really high. Yes, I do hope that there's a heaven out there from which you're listening. It will be truly comforting to know you're hearing me out. You stay in all of our hearts and minds. Rest in peace, hermano. This is where the night ends, a restaurant called Heaven. I don't know if that's a sign or anything, but yeah. I mean, pretty, pretty awesome, to be honest. I guess that's how the vlog ends. Wow.